few years ago, I realized that we all speak with an accent, and we tend to think that the one that has an accent is the other person speaking to us, or the one that we're listening to. I remember this one time when I went to Mexico, uh, this Mexican man came up to me, and he just ended up saying, I love the way Argentines speak because they speak funny. So really, I'm the one who had a funny accent. He was shocked of the way that I spoke. He said that Argentines have this funny accent when we talk, and I never really noticed it. After that, in fact, I had to decide to study the art of communication and learn how to adapt a more neutral way of speaking and replace some words that were too Argentine to comprehend and change them for other words that others could understand. But you really can't change your accent. Argentines have one way of pronouncing and other Latin American countries have their own accent. Sometimes we're just unaware that we have an accent and everyone has one. There are different types of accents and one is a visual accent. It's a type of processing preconception, more of a lens that shapes our perspective of the world, our perspective of the Bible, our perspective of God. It makes us see things the way we think they are, not as they truly are. So we validate what we already believe in. We end up taking for granted things that are the way they are. And we want to validate our conceptions, what we were taught. And it's very hard to unlearn what we were taught. Knowing that the brain is a lazy muscle, we decide not to change our thoughts at all. Someone once filled a barrel with multicolored flags and said to the observers to count the yellow flags only. Then he asked to close their eyes and to recall how many red flags there were inside the barrel. No one really remembered because they had seen selectively. If we look at the Bible selectively, we might say something that it really does not say at all. We only see a small fragment. To give you just an example, for Christians, the word loyalty, once again, this is just an example of what I want to say in a moment. I'm just building the foundation in order to give the teaching that I have in my heart, okay? So for us Christians, the word loyalty is defined as agreeing with a leader. That's what we say, right? I have loyal servants. I have loyal leaders because they obey, because they say yes to everything I say. They're never in disagreement. So disagreement is interpreted in our Christian atmosphere as disloyalty. If someone is in disagreement, then immediately we consider them disloyal. But the truth is that loyalty is tested when we disagree on something. David's loyalty to Saul was not demonstrated when he was the king's favorite son-in-law, but when he lived in the desert persecuted by his father-in-law. But we usually see loyalty through the lens of our accent. This is just one example. Sometimes we believe that the Bible says certain things when in reality it just doesn't. We say the Bible says you're supposed to be loyal, so don't rebel against your leader. And loyalty doesn't mean that you're always in agreement. But even in disagreement, I can still be loyal. I always tell the church, look, I'm your pastor. This is your church. We have a vision and we know where we want to go. If someone doesn't like it or disagrees, you can leave whenever you want and find another church with a different vision. But please be faithful to that vision, although sometimes you might not understand it. Years ago, I was having lunch at an airport, waiting for my connection flight. I really don't remember where I was going, but I do remember the incident I'm going to tell you now. So I'm trying to eat in those restaurants inside the airports. By the way, I really miss being inside in an airport. But suddenly, a woman just comes up to me. She starts staring at me and she says, Oh, you look so much like Dante Gebel. <laughs> She said, I can't stop looking at you. You look so much like him. So she was assuming that I looked like him, but was not him. 
You look so much like him. Really, I do? I said, yes, yes. It's just that Dante's younger than you. He has shorter hair than you. Darker skin. A little bit chubbier. I always see him on TV. You should see him too. Listen to him. It's going to do you good. She invited me to listen to myself on TV. I didn't want to argue with a lady. If she wanted to freeze me in her mind when I was 30 years old, hey, who am I to argue? And deep down, I understand. I can even imagine her saying to her family and friends, I saw a Dante give it look alike. The thing is that once you get an idea of what someone looks like, it's easy to leave that person frozen in your mind. She had already defined me. She put me in her portrait, and that's the way she thought of me. Dante in her own little box. I was inside a box. In theory, for her, I was chubbier, I had shorter hair, darker skin, and younger. <laughs> That was the Dante in her box. And it happens daily. It happens to all of us. It happens, like, for example, when they see me host a TV show or the one I have on Vortex or Dante Night Show. Those who know me for 30 years now and they heard my radio program saying, this Dante never changes. He's always the same thing. I used to listen to him back then when he was on the radio. But those that know me from not too long ago... I don't know, 10 years ago, preaching at the Crystal Cathedral, they said, what happened to him? Why did he abandon sound doctrine? And now he has a show. They don't know where I came from. They don't know what I used to be doing in the past. So this has to be good as an example. For the people that go to church and they think they know just a little bit of God. The same thing happens with people. It happens in the scriptures and it happens with God. Boxes or tags... They help everything be organized. They don't let the cereal spill on the floor. Books get mixed. When it's all about organizing or tagging things, it's wonderful. But when you try to explain to people, it won't work. When it's about defining Christ, it works less. So the Palestine contemporaries of Jesus, they tried to label him, to put him in a box. They designed a number of boxes, and none of them worked. They called him revolutionary, but he paid taxes. Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. They tagged him as a simple carpenter, but the scholars were confused with his wisdom. They went to see his miracles, and he refused to please them. They wanted him to transform the water into wine, just like he did in Cana. Nope. You're blind, poor, and naked, and he did not give them a miracle crusade. He was a Jew who attracted Gentiles, a rabbi who drove the religious people crazy, a holy man who was seen with prostitutes, oh, and people with low reputations. Inside a male-dominated society, he recluded women. He spoke like a king, yet he lived like a pilgrim. And people could not label him. They're still trying to label him. Years have passed by and people continue to label Jesus. In fact, some people have a miniature Jesus attached to their wall. Some have it in their cars, hanging from the rear view mirror. Some people pray over an image of Jesus. It's sort of like having a myth. If I touch it, it'll give me good luck. A preacher on TV says that if we make a covenant sowing money, Jesus is obligated to give you what you ask for because he has to honor your covenant. So reduce Jesus to a handful of doctrines. Jesus is a recipe and we have the ingredients. And if we mix them well, boom, Jesus will appear. Just like, you know, the genie in the movie Aladdin, right? The blue genie. If we rub the lamp, boom, then Jesus will appear to grant us our three wishes. Even Christians, we prefer to have a God who we can handle, who we can control, and to say what we would like God to say, just like we spoke of last time. So people of the time of Jesus, they did not know what to do with him because they couldn't tag him. Just like the lady who saw me saving all distances, who saw me in the airport, no, you look like that to give it, but you're not. And even though I could have showed her my ID, there was no way of convincing her. She had me in her box. The Dante she wanted inside her box. Maybe she even remembered me from a picture that I had in one of my first books. <laughs> the thing is, 
There was no way of letting her know that I was really him. The same thing happened with Jesus. He spoke in riddles. He healed the sick. He resurrected the dead. So for the people in his time, Jesus was someone who would bring confusion and he would scandalize. The reason it confuses us is because we always want to make Jesus someone he's not. And we want to make the gospel into something that it's not either. Peter, John, and Jacob also tried to do it. I think, why would Jesus take them to that famous expedition of Matthew 17, where it says that Jesus took Peter, James, John, his brother, and led them to a high mountain, and he transfigured himself. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration, the episode of Transfiguration? He transfigured himself before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. Most historians, they place this event on a mountain that's at least 3,000 meters high, called Mount Hermon. And this gigantic snow-caped peak was the perfect place for Christ's retreat with Peter, James, and John. Far away from the crowd and only the four friends, Jesus only had a couple of months to go to the cross, And at some point, as Jesus was praying, the carpenter became a cosmic figure. The Word of God says that he transfigured before them, and his face started to shine like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. The glow came from every pore of his skin and clothes. Mark says, the evangelist, that his garments became so white There was no way that any man on earth could make it that white. So it wasn't the work of bleach. It was the presence of God. God is light, the scriptures say, and there is no darkness in him. He dwells in the inaccessible light. So the transfigured Christ is Christ in his purest form. So Peter, James, and John never had seen him like this. They saw him walk on the water, multiply bread, talk to the winds, raise the dead. But never, ever have they seen him like a burning torch. They thought they've seen it all. But two other people came. Remember the story? Moses and Elijah. The deliverer and the prince of prophets passed through the veil that separates earth from paradise. So those who appeared surrounded by glory spoke of his departure that Jesus was going to fulfill in Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah were what? The... The Washington and the Lincoln of the Jews? The Saint Martin and the Simon Bolivar of Latin America? I can imagine the picture of Elijah and Moses on every Jewish museum. But now the fiery mountain made Peter commit a mistake. He wanted to put Jesus inside a great heroes of Jewish history box. <laughs> We all have a box. Peter said, I got it. I know what to do. That's a revelation. I want to put Jesus inside the great heroes of Jewish history box. Let's make three monuments for you guys. God didn't even let him finish the sentence. I believe Peter must have had some Hispanic DNA. While Peter was still speaking, a cloud of light covered him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. There is no other Peter. He is unique. Neither Moses nor Elijah, neither Buddha nor Mohammed. This is not the best of my children. He is the beloved son. So Peter, John, and Jacob, they were like astronauts landing on the surface of the moon. They saw what no other human being saw. Jesus in his cosmic greatness. The word of God says they fell on their faces and they had great fear. So the fiery mountain led them to a fear they didn't know before. It was a good fear, a holy fear. They found the God who put the stars like diamonds on velvet. They found the God that would take prophets in fiery chariots. They met the God that left Pharaoh cursing when he saw his officials drowned in the Red Sea. The disciples were left with their faces on the ground in shock. They could not believe that that was Jesus in spite of seeing him resurrect the dead. But they put him in a box. 
And I believe that most of our fears take away our sleep and our peace, but this fear that these three disciples had were different. It's the fear when God comes out of your box. Out of your box. How long have you not felt that fear? When was the last time that you had an understanding of Christ that left you breathless and it made you fall on your knees? I'm not talking about that Christ that's similar to a multi-level. and I'm talking about a different type of Christ. It's that moment where you're filled with reverent fear. If it's been a while, that means that you're afraid of everything. When Christ is great, your fears are small. As your vision of Christ grows, the fears of life, they diminish. A small, tiny Jesus, a Sunday Jesus has no power over cancer cells. A small, tiny Jesus has no power over COVID-19. Our Sunday Jesus is what we use to hang on our rearview mirrors. You might say, I don't have one. But our Sunday Jesus is very similar. We put him in a box, and that's why fears are so great. Look, we're very careful when we have to go out on the streets. You've seen videos of us handing out bags of food out on the streets. So our pastoral team, we use all the preventive measures because, of course, it's like getting on a car and not putting on your seatbelt. We put on our masks. We put on our gloves. Because besides all that, the law tells us we have to. So... We have to, and we do it. But I'm amazed of Christians saying, don't go out. Oh, don't take off your mask. We want Dante alive. Don't let him die. Really? It's not like I'm going to go and tempt God, but I don't understand why everyone falls into this panic. I'm a son of God. I make it clear. I'm not saying I'm not going to put on a mask. I'm not going to put on gloves. I don't care about the quarantine. I understand this is part of prevention. Now, panic attacks, fear... I never went out to the streets in fear. I never handed out bags of food to people thinking I'm going to die for doing it. No. The thing is, a Sunday Jesus has no power upon COVID-19 or financial collapses or family calamities. A Jesus box is portable. It fits inside your wallet. It fits on your shelf. But it won't do anything against your fears. And Jesus saw the little box to which they had confined him, the disciples. He saw their future. He saw the persecution. He saw how Rome was going to take them into prison. The demands of the church, and he knew that a version of the size of a box was not going to work. He took the margins off their preconceptions. And all their fears melted like ice cubes in the summer. They would say, like David later on, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's not that God changes. We change when we see more of God. It's not like God changes. We change when we see more of God. We see dimensions, aspects, and characteristics that we've never seen. So we can't define Christ to doctrine, a denomination, Not even to what a pastor says. Not even what I say. Therefore, I am convinced that in this difficult season the planet lives in, God is giving us a new strategy out of the box that will be a catalyst for a worldwide movement. I'm convinced of it. It's not a word of encouragement. I'm not a life coach, necessarily. I believe it. I believe in a movement that this big harvest will come. This pandemic is going to redefine the church just as we know it. It will redefine us. Acts 15, in the book of Acts, chapter 15, it's the chronicle of a council meeting to decide what to do with the Gentiles. The famous council of Jerusalem, for those who are theologians, So the Gentiles, they were saved. They were not Jews. They were called Gentiles, but saved. They were filled with Greek mythology, polytheism. So they were worshiping many gods. They worshiped the God of rain, the God of the sun. 
Gentiles basically worshipped every god you could imagine, right? That's what they would always do. It was part of their culture. Besides, they didn't know anything about the Old Testament. They had no idea who Moses was. They didn't know anything about the creation or the flood or David, Esther, Abraham was another stranger to them. So when they entered the kingdom of God, they began to redefine the church. The apostles, well, they held a summit to know what to do with them because the kingdom was getting populated by these hillbillies. Paul and Barnabas, they told how the Gentiles lived amazing miracles. Look, they're Gentiles. They have no idea who Moses is or Esther. But God is using them and blessing them, filling them with the Holy Ghost. Peter himself was telling people how they never followed any religious rituals, but they were filled with the power of God. So the apostles had to decide if they were going to allow the movement of the Spirit to redefine the church just as they've known it, or were they going to cut that movement to protect their Jewish identity? So, to make a long story short, they reached the following conclusion after that long meeting. This is their conclusion. Therefore, I consider that we should stop putting obstacles in the way of the Gentiles who convert to God. Let's not be a hindrance to the Gentiles, forcing them to circumcise or know who Moses and Abraham was. Did they have to know what animals went inside the ark? Why God left the mother-in-law outside the ark? Let's not complicate their lives. Continuing with the conclusion of the Council of Jerusalem, this is their conclusion once again. Because it had seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to impose any burden on them. The rest is history. The gospel began to spread throughout the entire world with more force than ever. And this pandemic brought us in that same threshold again. A huge harvest is about to take place that will come from the people least expected and in the ways unexpected. Just look at the closed churches. Do you think that Jesus went out on vacation? Do you think that really happened? I think that the church is going to redefine itself and it is right now in this very moment. People will appear knowing nothing about religion, nothing about theology or the foundations of the history of the church, what we believe in, the four square church believes in, the assemblies of God believe in. They'll know nothing about that. And we're going to have to face the same decision as our ancestors in the famous council of Jerusalem. Will we stop the movement of the Spirit to save the Jesus of the box? Or will we accept the risk of being misunderstood by the religious community? People even tell me, because I'm on Radio Vortex. It's a secular rock and roll radio station. The owner asked me if I could encourage the listeners without being religious. And I said, of course I can talk about Christian principles without the need of constantly saying, God, God, God. Bible verses just to make happy all those who have Jesus inside their boxes. They hired me to give encouragement to a country that needs biblical principles. Even if they don't know they're biblical, of course I'll do it. That's the way Jesus used to preach. Only one time do we see Jesus inside a synagogue, opening a squirrel and preach from it. Then he spoke about birds, about a woman who lost a coin. He spoke about the lost sheep, about the sower. That's why they crucified him. Jesus didn't fit in their rabbi box. He didn't preach in their synagogues. So religion always looks for a way to get away from the people who really need God the most. And we're going to have to face the storms of reputation and get our hands dirty with the souls of men. We're going to get our hands dirty for the souls of men. Huh? This isn't criticism. It's self-criticism. I understood that God was creating an unusual movement. In fact, he's doing it right now. Years ago, I read about illiteracy. 
The absolute illiterate is that person incapable of reading and writing. That's the way my grandmother was. She didn't know how to make her signature. She would just mark an X where her signature was. Then there's the grammar illiteracy. Those are the people who have no idea what the spelling and grammar rules are, and they write as the way they want to. Huh? I believe social media and text messages have a lot to do with that. Some people write, and it makes your eyes bleed on how bad their grammar is. That's the grammar illiteracy. But then you have the disuse illiteracy, which refers to those who once, once they finished the function of education, it's been fulfilled, they become illiterate for never touching a book in their lives again. These people graduated from elementary school, high school, even college, but they never opened a book again. You can see this in preachers by their lack of synonyms, by their, their poor dialect. That happens when we stop reading. Our moms used to tell us, read a lot, Dante, so you can have a rich language. We have a wonderful language, our inheritance from Cervantes. Spanish is wonderful. And not knowing how to speak isn't an excuse anymore. You have to read. Now anyone has access to any information. But that's a type of illiteracy. We also have the technological illiteracy, which refers to the inability to use new technologies. That's where most of us are in this category. It's hard to understand our remote controls, how to use apps. We usually have to ask younger people to help us. Finally, there's a spiritual illiteracy. And this refers to people who don't read the Bible. And if they do, they can't discern it. And they can only repeat what their pastor says, what their priest says, or what their rabbi says. And this illiteracy has reached our Christian people in a very alarming way. I touched this topic many times at church and throughout the conference tour I used to have. The book of Hebrews shows us that it's addressed to believers who have been well taught in biblical truths. So those who were reading that letter had already heard powerful preachings from anointed ministers and all the solid teachings are found in the first four chapters of Hebrews. When the author of this book writes, he's not addressing it to new believers. He's not addressing it to new converts. Now in chapter 5, the writer addresses those who were gathered and says the following. You have been slow to hear, because having already been teachers, after so long, you again need to be taught what were the first rudiments of the Word of God, meaning the sticks and apples. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So multitudes in the church have been well taught with full of biblical truth. We've experienced sermons, but most of us had borrowed spirituality. The most serious crisis that the Christian people are currently suffering in this time of pandemic, it's well known, is the development crisis. This crisis reveals that most of our church members are immature. I don't know the majority, but let's use an oxymoron. The great minority, let's just say that. They haven't grown at all. They have a certain chronological age as believers, but psychological and spiritual life hasn't developed at the same level. A father would get seriously concerned if his son doesn't grow normally and his body is disfigured in a grotesque way because of the lack of growth. And I think that the Lord feels the same pain when he sees believers who after 20 years, 30 years, are still in their cribs drinking from a bottle. It's a grotesque image. That's what they project because solid food causes indigestion. And their condition is not due to poor genetic training, oh poor little one, but to their disdain, according to the scriptures, for what God has placed within their reach for their normal development. So the diagnosis is what? Spiritual rickets. What does that mean? 
I'm just giving you this introduction before we get to the main idea. So what does spiritual rickets mean? Well, it's something the writer of the book of Hebrews highlighted, the incapacity of understanding. After all these teachings, you continue to be slow to hear. <laughs> I was surprised to hear what my colleagues told me before I became the pastor of River Church. They said, the day you don't talk about tithing and offerings, people will stop giving. And I know pastors who tell me I have to have two Sunday sermons, one regular sermon and another one for the offering. Otherwise, people will stop giving. I always thought that once you started sowing, you'll start reaping, and you never forget that. My parents taught me to take a bath once. They taught me only one time what I had to do after using the bathroom. If I constantly need to be reminded at the age of 30, 40, 50, it's obvious that I have a comprehension problem. Pastors told me, if you don't regularly tell people to arrive on time, they'll always come in late. Really? Shouldn't they learn that by now, that punctuality and excellence pleases God? Well, the writer of Hebrews says, no, some people are slow to understand. They should have been teachers by now, but we have to teach them again and again and again. Tell the person next to you, repeat after me, how many are happy, turn around and tell the person next to you. Really? Do we really need that childish way of teaching? Do we really need that? With 10, 20, even 30 years of being a Christian? The writer of Hebrews also points to the incapacity to make decisions. Some people just can't make steps of faith. They don't get married. They live together, but they don't get married. They're scared of a serious relationship. They're waiting for a divine confirmation to get married. They can't start anything on their own. They're pastor-dependent or leader-dependent. Mature people are always finding a way to give of oneself, resources, life, and time. Here at River Church, I don't even have to ask for people to give because they're mature. And they say, I know I have to help this ministry to continue what he's doing. They're just mature. They know they have to give. But immature people always need to be given. They need to know in what biblical verse it appears. If it's in the Old Testament, then it doesn't apply. But mature people follow the truth. Immature people are carried by any wave of diverse doctrines. They're always confused. I saw a YouTube video showing that this man is the Antichrist. They're always confused. Instead of seeing the Bible, reading the Bible, they watch YouTube videos. Mature people, on the other hand, know what God wants for their lives. Immature people have a permanent lack of decision or direction. They don't know where to go. Mature people have an increasing spirituality. They're constantly seeking God, studying the scriptures daily. More and more, they understand how to grow into an adult spiritual person. But immature people don't. They live a life in the flesh. They read a short Bible verse. They play pin to tell on the Bible. <laughs> or use it like if it were a fortune cookie. Or they use the Bible like if it were the horoscope. Just a short psalm if I have the time. But mature believers influence others by their convictions. Immature believers don't influence anyone. If they do, it's negative. So what's the diagnosis? You're not growing. They're not growing. But what worries me the most, what really terrifies me, is the fundamental symptom, the inability to transfer life. If you're a child and only drink milk, your organs can't reproduce. It doesn't matter how many teachings or good doctrine a church has. If it doesn't grow, it's because there's a spiritual retardation. People can say, no, you grow because you let anyone inside your church. No, 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 no. If your organs can reproduce, then a church can reproduce and grow. When you only eat milk and not solid food, your immune system is affected and you're exposed to contracting all kinds of diseases. You're spiritually atrophied, and you cannot even engender. In Israel, you can find the Dead Sea. I'm sure you've heard of it before. I had the chance to be there in person. It's an extensive lake that touches the borders of the Jordan. And the mineral deposits makes it one of the richest places on the planet. The normal seawater contains around what, I believe, 4% of mineral wa water. 
mineral content. That's what gives it that salty taste. But the Dead Sea has 22%. You can see the pillars of salt reaching from the surface. The water looks like baby oil. But you can't see the common landscapes that you normally see in the Middle East. There are no fishing villages, no fishing nets, no villagers selling fish, seagulls flying. No. The Dead Sea is rich, abundant, but dead. What's the reason? It has no exit. It's a dead end. And it only releases its entry of water through evaporation. It has no current waters. It has no flow or trace of life on its coast. And that is what God is changing with this pandemic. This pandemic is exposing the rickets of those who never had the ability to transfer life. They're like the Dead Sea, those who had no exit, those who had no way out. And I'm not saying that the old ways of doing things are wrong. Only that they're incompatible with the present time that we live in. And what a present time it is, huh? And the future that's coming. To reach people that nobody is reaching, we must do things that no one else is doing. Churches usually fall in love with our models, and I include myself. Models, in reality, their methods, are created to support the vision of the church, not to worship them. Models don't sustain visions. It's the other way around. There are churches that are tied to a model that no longer serve the original purpose. And many times a model can come into conflict with the vision. We fall in love with the way we do things and we ignore the vision, meaning souls. Not all churches know what their model is. Some use the model, the more activities, the better. Just come to church, more church, services on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, men's service, youth service, women's service, single service, desperate single services, and no ministry works But the sum of many makes us feel like we're doing a lot for God. They give you a huge bulletin with all the activities. People might think it works because we have lots of activities. But others use the model, what is the other church implementing of that famous pastor? Right? It's the trend of the conference of the month. So the pastor goes to a conference, returns to his church, and adds a new model to the church. And in the process of caring for a model, we neglect the original vision. What was it? My friend Carlos Anaconda would say, souls, souls, and lost souls. <laughs> Carlos always says to me, Dante, don't forget, you're an evangelist. And the heart of the Lord is always in souls. <laughs> His daughter says that I'm one of the best impersonators. I love Carlos. And I always keep at heart his advice. This is about souls. Carlos isn't the only one who says it. The scriptures say it too. For years, they taught us that we have to relate with unbelievers only to convince them that we are correct. How can I say this? The Christian community gives us permission to relate to homosexuals or another type of unbeliever as long as we can convert them and fast. It's the store seller syndrome. That's what we can call it. You know, when you go inside any fashion store, a seller approaches you. Hello, sir. Were you looking for something? Can I help you? He's not your friend. He wants to sell you something. Can I help you with something? He wants to sell something. No, I'm just looking. I'm just watching. That's all I'm doing. Another one comes in. Can I help you, sir? No, I don't need help to see. I know how to see. In that same way, unbelievers know when we're approaching them just to sell Jesus. And nothing of what we say sounds sincere. My question is, what would the relationship be like if we had a genuine interest in loving those people? People would notice it. Not that we want to convert them now and give them just one chance. No. What if we just get near them to love them? That's what I can clearly understand the Lord's doing in this time. Now that the church doors are closed, God wants to strategically place agents in the darkest corners of society. Jesus constantly described this this way. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into flour until it worked all through the dough. Matthew 13, 33. 
We're his secret agents, disguised as doctors, Christian nurses. I know they're heroes today. They're Christian nurses who have to guide dying patients in prayers before they die from coronavirus. There they are, fighting. They're fighting in the trenches. Housewives, computer programmers, school teachers, managers. That could be God's purpose to allow all these people to affect our society like the yeast in the dough. We're powerful believers, undercover as ordinary people, purposely assigned to serve our society. The Trojan horse was used by the Greeks to go inside through the walls of Troy. Remember? During the night, the soldiers opened the doors from the inside of the horse and caused the final fall of Troy. Babylon is the clear example of how God yeasted society through his secret agents. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, destroys Israel. He takes four young men prisoners. The Bible mentions their names, Daniel, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar was taken captive these four young men. When you first read the book, you could think that these men were now slaves and captives. But if you read it again, you will notice that God was actually taking Babylon captives through these four guys. God knows what he's doing. God's strategic plan begins when Daniel decides not to defile himself with the king's food and insists on praying three times a day, kneeling in direction of Jerusalem. Remember? I'm not going to bore you with a story. The other three joined the battle by refusing to bow before the idol Nebuchadnezzar had made. So when God saw that he had people who are not contaminated with the system, he united them to the culture. He did not put them inside a temple. He mixed them to their culture like yeast to the dough. They didn't contaminate themselves, but Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, who was really called Belsasar in Babylon, they even took Babylon names. Belsasar was one of the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. So for 70 years, these boys dismantled the power of darkness from the inside. King Cyrus was the last of the rulers Daniel served. And finally, the Persian king Cyrus, he freed God's people and even financed the billionaire temple project. Cyrus wrote a prototype of human rights that used to this day in the United Nations. So billions owe their freedom to Cyrus, a king who was advised by Daniel. A man who never suffered from spiritual rickets, nor was he hiding. During Daniel's 21-day fast, Cyrus was ruling. So a transformation requires assimilation, not just consumption. Just as some are lactose intolerant, many are gospel intolerant, creating a negative reaction. Others have heard so much religion that an antibody was made and they're immunized against the gospel. We owe the world a real encounter with God. We need a new plan created by the Holy Spirit, a new plan for a God that never changes. Just saying, if someone's scared of changes. We owe the world the manifestation of the children of God. So every time this quarantine extends itself, I wonder if God is the one who's planning this so that all this can really happen. What's going on right now? Just look at all the thousands connected online. Once, God showed us, and I spoke about this to our church, that the pool of Bethesda, found in the Gospels, represents where the church has been up to this day. And the Ezekiel River, which represents this new era that we're living, even after this pandemic ends. The Bible says in the Gospels that now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches, 
In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel descended from time to time into the pool and stirred the water, and the first who descended into the pool after the movement of the water was healed of whatever disease one had. It's in John chapter 5. The details are always important because the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. The five porches have a prophetic importance, and it's a beautiful image of the five ministries, prophet, apostle, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The five ministries that have been sent to equip the saints, and these are the ones who provide access to the direct power of God. So when the five ministries flow and converge, they create an incredible alliance with heaven. Now, why do I think this pandemic will move us from this reality of the pool of Bethesda to the river of Ezekiel? Well, because the pool represents a different government structure than the Ezekiel River. The pool represents this pastorship as we know it how it is today. The Ezekiel River represents an apostolate. And I know that some people get rashes when they hear the word apostle, but let me go on. When the United States wrote the Constitution, they wanted to create a government structure that was really different from the British, the British kind of ruling. Well, because the king had a lot of concentrated power. So they thought of a constitutional republic designed to limit the power of the president, basically, because he wasn't a king. And besides, it was a, a different type of government. And that way, they could balance the power and make major de decisions. But then they thought, and they said, What happens in times of war or in times of attacks, like what happened in that terrible 9-11? Well, a president with that bureaucracy, with a Senate, would be too slow to defend their country and win. So that's why they wrote what we call today the martial law. Martial law transforms a constitutional republic into a military government. And the president, when under attack, becomes into the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He doesn't need the majority of the Senate to approve any battle plan. He now has the power to make quick decisions. Just be careful not to push the red button, right? If martial law is not enacted during war, the very structure of the government, such as senators and everyone who has to vote, could limit the power to lead the forces. This is an example of how the government structure can empower or limit its leaders, right? In these years of Christian journey, I have observed how the church has built a government structure, putting Jesus inside a box, the church in another box, leaders in another box, And these structures are built around leaders, incapacitating them for what they have to do for God. Those are our own sacred cows that don't let us grow or try to see different ways of preaching. The protection of cows is one of the axes, right, of Hinduism. So everything that comes from a cow in Hinduism is sacred. And the same thing goes for Argentinians. I could never live in India. There are sacred cows roaming around in India and also in our churches. They're never examined objectively. They're just simply respected by those who are forced to live with them. Sacred cows can take many forms, but they're easy to locate with a simple question. Why are we doing this? If the answer is because we've always done it this way, or if it's that's the way we do it here, it's very likely that we found a sacred cow, ladies and gentlemen. And it's serious when we add something to the gospel that's not necessary and it's preached as if it were in biblical terms, like saying it's not in the Bible, but it should. From there, things come out like, wow, he finished preaching and he didn't make an altar call. One time I went to River Church, and I don't like that pastor because he never made an altar call. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Imagine Jesus at the end of the Sermon of the Mount saying, Who wants to be my disciple? Raise your hand. Is there anyone who wants to come down from the fig tree? 
The altar call was invented about a hundred years ago. It was first used by Charles Finney as a means of separating those who wanted to talk more about salvation. The famous altar call. Is it good to do it? Yeah. But it's not bad if you decide not to. Otherwise, it's a sacred cow. Or how about the sinner's prayer? They told me, how dare you? You finished preaching and you didn't invite people to say the sinner's prayer. Imagine Jesus guiding his disciples to a sinner's prayer. God prefers to see only one true convert instead of an ocean full of decisions or convinced. I'm even guilty of this one. When I began preaching those first days, I used to say, give Jesus an opportunity. How about that? We said to people, give Jesus a chance. Like saying, try the shampoo. It won't make you get bald. Misinterpreting what Revelation 3.20 says, I am at the door and I am knocking. How many evangelists have used this verse to paint a pathetic image of Jesus? Jesus cold outside. Let me in. Open the door. The doorknob is on your side. It's cold outside. No, those words weren't for the lost. Those words were for the Laodiceans. It's Jesus knocking outside the door of his own church to let him in. That's why it says, He who has ears, let him listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is not outside. They are. And they can be knocking all night long like the five foolish virgins who had no more oil, but Jesus would never let them in, not until they met the requirements of a repentant heart. Or the follow-up to the new believers. They've told me, now that the church is closed, how do we follow up with people? We lost control of the people, someone told me. We lost the way to follow up. We have to call people on the phone so they won't get lost. I see Jesus' as life, and I am amazed he had no one to follow. This church model with the closed doors in times of pandemic is Jesus' model. Otherwise, he would be stuck in a synagogue saying, come, here I am, five services a day. He made people follow him. He called people to follow him. It was never the other way around. Make sure that the guy who got healed last week continues to listen to me. He always had that attitude. If you want life, you have to follow me. He never said, Peter, did you follow the young rich man? I think he left sad. Make sure and give him a New Testament Bible. No. I'm not saying to have a follow-up plan is bad. Don't misinterpret me. I'm saying that when that is transformed into a tradition and you don't do it, you're out of a doctrine, then you think you're out of heaven for doing it? It's because we're tied to a sacred cow. It's not even that important for you to have a Bible. It's important for you to put it to practice. A couple of Sundays ago, someone said, I don't like you say the verses by memory and you don't read them from the scriptures. Really? Really? I have to say, chapter 4, verse 5, page 126 of the New King James Version to be more spiritual. How many governors swear upon the Bible and do whatever they want? They're corrupted. Like if the Bible meant nothing to them. The Bible in itself has no power, not until you put it to practice and obey it. That's why we have to understand this season of change. This season is the one that seems the most similar to the first church, to the council of Jerusalem. Jesus out of the box. The Lord heals a man with mud. Remember? Question. Was there something in his saliva? Was there something in the water of the pool where he sent this man to wash his face? Where was the power? In the saliva? In the dirt? Or in the pool? Why, if this happens today, the three things would mark a doctrine. We would be the church of the saliva and the pool. And then we would divide ourselves, the holy saliva, the holy holiest of salivas. <laughs> Why did Naaman have to dive seven times into the river? Because seven is a perfect number. No, it could have been ten leaping frogs, ten turns around a tree, fourteen jumping jacks. The big issue was dealing with his pride, his obedience, his faith, persistence, and character. 
This man is a creature with customs and inclined to traditions. That's why it's very important to understand leaders to know this. What time or what season are we leading? If we don't understand these times of change, we will not know how to lead correctly in this crisis. We'll get desperate. Well, people are going to stop giving an offering. People are going to forget who their pastors are. I can't disciple them. I can't have my cell group. People will get desperate because the Jesus in the box is out. That's what the rabbis did with Jesus. Go to the synagogue and do miracles in here, not outside in the streets. And Jesus was outside of the box. He was out in the streets. Doing ridiculous things like spitting on mud, healing people on the Sabbath. Pastors, we're shepherds, right? That's what we do. We like to gather the sheep. We like to tend to the sheep and their needs. And the people who follow us are basically sheep. So, the governmental structure of a pastorate is like the pool of Bethesda, in which people gather for a supernatural encounter. But I go to the pool of Bethesda and I realize I had to spend a long time until an angel would move the waters. And many, many go to church for that same reason. You need to be saved. What do you say? Go to church. Everyone who has a TV show, we would say, come see our services or come to our services. I'm never going to write down, give me your address so I can visit you in your home. No. Look at the church we have. We want you to come here too. You need to be saved. Come to church. You need to be advised. Deliverance. Come to church. So, just like the Pool of Bethesda, miracles were not frequent. There was a time of visitation, every now and then a miracle, a night of miracles. But sometimes you have to spend a long time in front of the pool for a miracle to happen. Sometimes the water might be stirred. And I know people that say, yeah, the waters were stirred today. A prophet came and the service was nice. We brought a prophet as a guest. Others say, it was nice. The Holy Spirit visited us. He visited us. If he visited, then that means he doesn't dwell. A visitation can come or not. When someone says, we had a visitation of the Holy Spirit, question, what about the days he hasn't visited you? Who did? <laughs> he visited us. He's the one who should dwell there. Sometimes we have Jesus like, hey, welcome to this place. Visit us. And if you don't, well, but the Ezekiel River, ah, that offers a different picture. It says in Ezekiel, Then he made me go back to the entrance of the house, and behold, waters came out from under the threshold towards the east. And then it says, And he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Then he took me, and he made me go back to the riverbank. And when I returned, I saw that on the banks of the river there were many trees on either side. And he said to me, These waters go out to the eastern region, and they will enter into the sea, and the waters will bring healing. And every living creature, every living soul that swims, wheresoever these two rivers enter, they will live, and there will be many fish, and there will be healing. And every living creature, every living creature that's in this river shall live. And right next to its banks, to one and to the other side, all kinds of fruitful trees will grow. Its leaves will never fall. Its fruit will always be there. In time, it will mature because its waters come out from the sanctuary and its fruit shall be good to eat and its leaf for medicine. Ezekiel 47. There is a whole lot of revelation in these verses. Water, just like the water in the pool, represents the grace of God flows below the threshold. It's like it comes out from here. From here, from where I'm standing. Like the water comes out from here. Beneath my feet. And then it goes out from the platform. It flows below. And it deepens as you go farther away. It goes to Broadway Street. 
That describes a moment in which the presence of God becomes more powerful as the people bring it into the world. Businesses, homes, schools, out of the walls. I do not believe the Lord is worried because I heard people say, the devil has closed the church doors. The devil has no power. The devil wants to close the church. I don't believe the power of the devil is that big. Hell cannot prevail against the church. The Bible says that as farther away the waters go from the sanctuary, from the temples, from your box, the deeper it will be. Dick Joy said, just like a jeweler spreads a black velvet cloth over the counter to display a precious stone, so the Lord uses the darkness of the circumstances. The Lord uses COVID-19 as a backdrop to manifest His glory in the church. In other words, the greatest miracles The most powerful expressions of the kingdom are destined to occur in the worst places on the planet and at the worst times like this one, ladies and gentlemen. Remember this. This revelation of the river of Ezekiel is adapted to the apostolate because it means sent. In the pool, the needy have to go to a certain location to get healed. Come to church. But the Ezekiel River flows through our cities. It flows through streaming. Today, people decide what table to sit on and eat. What pastor can now control his congregation? I can't. How do I know that my church is listening to me? Or if they're listening to Cashlona? How do I know that what people are doing right now? How can I say, pay attention to me, repeat after me? I don't know if you're saying it. I always say, sit in the room and listen to this sermon. But maybe you're cooking right now. I don't know. I'm sure you're in your home. But I don't know if you're sitting down in your toilet with your cell phone watching me right now. And I can't force you to listen to me. Maybe you want to listen to another pastor. People decided where to sit down and eat. And we, it gives us insecurities. Well, because a pastor gathers like the pool, but an apostle sends like the river. The word apostle before someone says, I don't believe in apostles. Let me just continue and don't think I'm going to consider myself an apostle. The word apostle comes from the Roman secular world. The Romans were very aggressive to extend their empire, you know. They decided to implant their culture a dictatorial government. And so they had embassies in different places and they would force their culture. They were called apostles. And apostles is not a word that Jesus invented. The Romans did. When Jesus promoted his disciples so they would understand what their job was going to be, he didn't call them patriarchs. He didn't call them priests or rabbis. If he would have said, you are now my rabbis, I'm sure the disciples would have thought they had to hide in a synagogue. He called them by the political title that they would understand and it would define their calling and their responsibility. If they call me Dante, you're going to be an ambassador. I know what I'm going to be. I have to represent my country in a different nation. When he said, you're going to be apostles, just like the Roman armies, first they fought for their territory and then they sent apostles to teach them the culture to get inside society, the guys understood. An apostle is an envoy to establish their culture, in this case, the culture of heaven on earth. An apostle is sent to release heaven on earth. It's not for them to have a mega church or for people to call them apostle. That's why nothing has to do with a title that many people are scared of or self-title themselves with. We're talking about a church that's apostolic in times of crisis. A leader can plant a hundred churches, but if those churches do not bring, bring about a cultural transformation in their cities, they're not apostolic. Here we gather, in regular times, 10,000 people every Sunday in Orange County. But in Orange County, there are 3,200,000 people. 
And the crime rate remains the same. The divorce rate doesn't change. Gangs continue to grow. It means we're not being light or salt. It doesn't matter if we grow to eight services per Sunday. Gathering believers just for a couple of hours on Sundays is not as synonymous for cultural transformation. It's ineffective to be light. I hope God will allow us to gather again and change the negative stats of a city because that will always speak good of the church. We can't say the neighborhood is bad, but the church is good because the blood of Christ will cover us from all death. Let's take it out of context. A church arrives to a place and people have to say, these who have turned around the whole world are now here, just like in Acts 17, 6. A church that goes to a city will flip it over. We're in the streets. And because many never wanted to understand this in time, boop, the doors were closed and now we're going to have to go out on the streets because as the quarantine is less strict, maybe the last thing they might open are mass gatherings. And in this, there has to be a divine plan. I've heard what our governor has said. He said, the last thing that's going to be reopened are soccer games, sports events, mega churches. So I'm going to say this with fear and trembling. The way that we have to pastor might not be designed to transform cities. It was developed to attract people to create a culture of Bethesda where the flocks gather and get healed and are happy. Here, there's a happy family in normal times. But most of our pastor rates are often irrelevant to society because our government structures were built to gather, not to unfold. They were built to make to resist, not to attack. We were the resistance instead of being the invading army. The apostolic government, like Ezekiel, creates a supernatural atmosphere that affects everything it touches, just like we read it. From the fish, which represents people, the trees, the nations and cities on its shores. Wherever the river touches, this one that Ezekiel saw, everything is productive. It produces fruit all year round, not just in one season, not when a prophet comes, not on Easter, not on Christmas, not when we have a night of miracles, all the time. That's the difference between the pool and the river. That's why we felt we had to change our name. We are now called River Church. It has nothing to do with a soccer team in Argentina called River. That's not the club I like, besides. It's not Boca Church, it's River Church. Now, in this pandemic... The transition from a pastorate to an apostolic form of government does not eliminate our call. It repositions us. I'm trying to encourage my colleagues. It repositions us. Believe me on behalf of the Lord. The sheep will continue to congregate, whether personally, by streaming, but not to be just a happy and healthy bunch. The weak people we have to control, feed me with milk, but to be trained to be sent to the world like the yeast inside the dough. And as the church makes this transition, services are no longer social gatherings, but supernatural training sessions in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news. Remember that? Right? To bend the brokenhearted. To publish freedom to the captives. The prisoners. To open their cells. To proclaim the year of the Lord's goodwill. The day of vengeance of our God. To comfort the mourners. To order the afflicted of Zion. Be given glory instead of ashes. Oil of joy instead of mourning. Cloak of joy instead of anguish. They shall be called trees of righteousness, planting by the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 61. Isaiah says these very people who are transformed are going to be commissioned to rebuild cities. Isaiah 61.4 says they will rebuild the ancient ruins. 
They will restore the rubble of yesterday. They will repair the ruined cities and the rubble of many generations. I believe the time of a supernatural church is coming. It's the last greatest opportunity we're going to have before the second return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We all have natural talents with which we are, are gifted with. Look, I know how to draw. and I've been doing it since I can remember. Others are good to do business. Others have the ability to lead a good church. But I don't want the church or my ministry to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. When God does not show himself in a service, it bothers me. It makes me very mad. Many years ago, I was happy when crowd just came to hear me preach. But those days are long gone. No, I only want the Holy Spirit to do things that it can't be attributed to me. I want to live a life in a way that it can't be reproduced or faked. Because if it's about filling churches, the majority are doing it well. Good speaker, an attractive service, a nice building, good music. But God wants something much more than just lights and music in a stage. Remember the prophets of Baal? They had a loud and exciting worship meeting that lasted from morning to noon. But no one answered or paid attention. Then Elijah prayed, and the fire came down from heaven. Elijah prayed, says the song, and fire descended. Joshua prayed, remember that? And the sun had stopped. I love it. Elijah prayed and fire descended. Joshua prayed and the sun stopped. My favorite part of the story is when it all ends and the prophets of Baal say, The Lord, the God of Elijah, is a real God. They didn't say, Elijah, what a great speaker. Did you see the praise? The praise team in Elijah's church? That guy does know how to make a church service. Did you hear the prophetic declarations he said? Did you see Elijah? How he prayed? There was so much anointing? Wow. No. Everyone knew what happened could not be manipulated by Elijah. They didn't leave talking about the Elijah of God. They left talking about the God of Elijah. I ask myself how many times people leave from our services and not about the fire that fell in our services. When I read about the book of Acts, that church was unstoppable. The gates of hell could not prevail against it. The church spread it like a wildfire out of the box, out into the streets, not because of a strategic planning or a movement of music. It was a movement of the Spirit. They had no temple. They didn't have PayPal for offerings. They didn't make live videos to encourage the believers to give an offering. When did you see someone making an old church live streaming? Otherwise, people are going to forget about us. We're always trying to find a way for people to give. We understand the importance of giving. I think that many churches nowadays are everything except unstoppable. They can be derailed by the resignation of a pastor because he sinned, by disagreements in the board because there's no budget, or because they can no longer gather because the government doesn't allow them to. No more church. I don't want River Church to be explainable without God. That's why I'm fascinated to say that in this moment, we're better than ever. Even when we can't gather, God knows I'm not lying. We have oil. We're gathering baskets full. We're going out to give out food. God blesses us. People from around the world are calling us. God with a white glove, poof, slapped me right in the cheek and said, my church will continue and I don't need you. I always mention the worst insult that you can give me is when you flatter my talents and you overrate me, underestimating the power of God in my life. 
Oh, Dante, but you know how to talk good. You're sympathetic. It makes me angry that you underestimate what God does in my life. I might be a good speaker, but I can't convince people to be obsessed with Jesus. Maybe I can convince them to pray, but I can't convince them to fall in love with Jesus. That's why I desperately need the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. I can make you see me just a little bit, but for this long, online, live, normally they say, I need a 15-minute version of this sermon because people get distracted. No one moved. I can't do that. My question is, when was the last time that you undeniably saw the working of the Holy Spirit in your life? Where you said, without God in this equation, it can't happen. Don't say, yeah, when I bought that car or I didn't have good credit. No, no, no. Things that can happen to any old person, no. I'm talking about that experience that only could have happened through God. If you can't remember the last time, man, you've been weak for way too long with a borrowed spirituality. You have knowledge, but you don't have a relationship with him. The disciples were guided in an intimate and powerful way. And maybe this virus made you see that you only knew him in the mind, but you've never experienced him. We know of the Jesus that can make people walk on waters, but you never walked on water yourself. If you just want to be a good person, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. Just pay your taxes. Kiss your mother-in-law. Don't kick the cat and you're a good person. But this season is not only to be a good person. It's for you to realize that the church must get out of the box. The church of the book of Acts was unstoppable. They had no temple. They were persecuted. These were the times where being a Christian wasn't saying something. It was living it. Being a Christian was putting a price to your head. They were not impeded by social distancing or by health rules to not congregate. They did not congregate because they were going to get their heads chopped off. But the church kept on extending itself and the gates of hell could not prevail against it. They were unstoppable. And that's the type of church we're going to have now. In this time, we're going to see the legitimacy of those who serve the Lord. This is the time to understand we're going to stop being a pool to see if the waters stir and we're going to be transformed into a river. We're going to be yeast that affects our society. Secret agents, Trojan horses placed inside Babylon that from the inside we can change politics, give new laws. Otherwise, we're always going to end up throughout this time going outside to protest against abortion, against, against equality. We're always the one to protest. We think if we're many, they're going to listen to us. They're not. Not until we're inside voting. And for this, you need to get inside society. To get inside the culture without bowing down before the gods of Babylon. Otherwise, we just can continue to do marches. We have to manifest against Netflix. Why not change Netflix from the inside or generate new material instead of criticizing or saying, let's disactivate ourselves, let's unsubscribe ourselves. Then everyone came back throughout the time of the pandemic, right? But we can't live in that hypocrisy, criticizing everything and never proposing anything. People should know us for everything that we offer and not by things that we protest to. The church has to be a river more than ever now. And I know there are youth that are watching me right now. And many of you have been following me since you were very young. People say, Dante, you're growing old. You have gray hairs now. I used to follow you when you were in Christian radio. What did I used to preach back then? When I would go to Argentina and different tours in the year 2000? When we finished the tour in Boca Juniors 20 years ago, what did we preach about? What did we say? I always told you, go inside the classrooms, get into the culture, conquer TV, 
Get into the secular media. Market difference. Get out of the ghetto. Of course, many couldn't. Because in my case, I grew outside of the system. But many now have a roof that won't let them grow. They have a leader who won't let them. In my case, God made a way so that I would grow outside of the system. I was sort of like, you know those mushrooms that only grow on the side of the road? Everyone prayed for me to fall. Everyone prayed for me to stop preaching. But Gamaliel said, what's of God remains throughout the years. It's the gift of longevity. But God gives us all a unique opportunity. We are in the cornerstone of history where we're going to have to decide if we're going to continue to be a pool and wait for the church to open so that people can come to us or understand what God is trying to tell us and go, go out. But not to hand out just bags of food. Not only just to hand out food and give a helping hand, we have to go out and preach. Find new ways of preaching. A new way, I don't know. I wish I knew what that new way could be. But find new strategies to preach, to go out. This streaming is one of them. I don't know what other way. It's been weeks and I've got up and I've said, Lord, tell me. Tell me what's coming. What, what do we have to do? We have an army in River Church in throughout the entire city. And I miss them a whole lot. But there they are in their homes waiting for my command. Stay in your positions. Alive, wounded, or dead. I promise to take you home. I'm your pastor and we're in this together. I will not abandon you. Stay in your positions until I tell you otherwise. Read your Bible. Pray more than ever. Fill yourself with God. You never depended on me. I never made you be pastor dependent. You know what I'm talking about. I've always told you, I'm a fallen man, a man who can fail you, and I'm not going to be in charge of your life. I can barely take care of mine. I can't re be responsible for yours. I can only teach you and guide you to the presence of God. I'm just a tour guide, exposing the works of art. That's all. So, now, Reverend Church, apply everything I taught you. You have all our sermons on our official website. See all of them as much as you want. But remember everything that we've learned together. Just be alert. Don't be scared. No one in the ark got off sick. The hippopotamus didn't catch a pest when he was in the ark. Don't worry. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Just stay in your positions and pray. Cry out fast. So, continue to be where you are. Because in one moment, buck, the change will happen and we're going to continue to be the river we've always been. We're going to Europe now. We're blessing ministries. We're helping everyone we can. And I say, wow, God wanted us to be a river and it's been fulfilled. Remember when I told you this could end up anywhere. You are the church. We are the church. This building can be sold tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Elton John can sing here again. We are the church right there at your school, wherever you are right now. When this quarantine ends, then you will be an agent of change. You will be yeast, light in the darkness. You cannot hide light. It just goes out. River. May everywhere you go, may there be fruit all the time. I pray for those who are listening for the first time so you can receive Jesus in your heart. So you can receive him right now. Someone can help you say this prayer of faith right there where you are. Because here at River, you don't need to make an altar call. No one's going to write down your name. No. If the conversion is real, you will follow Jesus. I pray for everyone who belongs to this river. I pray for everyone who's part of this squad against the enemy. Squadron of the army of God, I pray. Because we're in a time of harvest. I pray because the best days are yet ahead of us.
Because on behalf of the Lord I say unto you, the things that eyes have never seen, ears have heard, risen to your heart, are the things He has prepared for you. The best, the best season, the best days of your life are yet ahead of you. Here from River Arena, I release these prophetic blessings to you. So the real apostles, not those that self-title themselves or think it's a title, better than pastors, no, no, no. Not those who think they're apostles just to give fatherhood. The real apostle, the apostolic church is you. The sent to be placed inside cultures. Now that everyone can become a fertile ground, this is the day of salvation. So don't be scared. And if you do have to pass away through this disease, no, you're going straight to heaven. Death, where is your sting? Ha! Come on, we got the best message. May God bless you. May God keep you safe. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to pray for you, to bless you, And we <laughs> will see you again, God willing, if this doesn't change, within seven days. It's incredible all the people who are connected online. You've been faithful, huh? You haven't left. I'll see you soon. Army of the living Lord, may God bless you. May God keep you safe and may his face shine upon you. I bless you in your entrance and your leaving when you get up, when you lay down, when you work, when you rest, because you deserve it. May God bless your mind, your heart, your soul, your body. May God give you strength. May you be firm. May God bless you. And I'll see you soon. Stay here with us. Listening to this last song. And that way you'll know when to reconnect again. Thank you once again for being here. And thank you for being faithful. You're the best crowd a speaker could really have. Goodbye. See you soon. God bless you. Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciendo menos temas Yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas Me sanaste en mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome Una y otra vez oh, oh, oh. Bienvenido, eres amado una y otra vez oh, 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 oh. Bienvenido a River, eres amado oh. Oh. Apareciste en una noche de soledad Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas Estoy aquí, el Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Eres que me Para ser